Once upon a time, in a forest, far, far away, in a deep black forest in the heart of Africa, there was a group of apes. And these apes have to, had to face many trials of life. They had to find food, food that came from uncertain sources, that had to be traveled for, for many, many kilometers a day. They had to find of predators, and apart from predators, many other dangers. There's snakes, there's wild boars, there's branches that fall, there are parasites, there are neighboring communities. So this is kind of serious life, real stuff that these apes had to solve. And yet, they spend a lot of time socializing. You're like, guys, what are you doing? You have real stuff to solve. You're socializing. Yeah, they groom a lot, for instance. So when I'm watching these apes in the forest do this kind of stuff, I think, hmm, this reminds me of a certain other ape that also spends a lot of time socializing, right? Look around you. Um, and we're not just here socializing in any way. We're socializing here in a way that to me is most fascinating. It's the most, perhaps, expensive, exuberant, colorful, even dangerous. It's festivals. Humans do collective celebrations. We do ecstatic rituals. We do dance. Why the hell do we spend so much money, time, effort, preparing, engaging in these festivals? Why are we here? Why are you here? Why did you come to Burning Man? Um, so that's the question of today. Um, and I think the apes in the forest, who socialize in the forest, have a lot to tell us about why we're here. And in a nutshell, it goes down to play. Playing animals and human festivals are not different. Playing animals is about shared joy, and festivals and human celebrations are about shared joy. In shared joy we bond, and it's the space of creativity, and that's what festivals and play do. Um, but it's not a new thing. You know, people have been doing it for ages. If you think just around 5,000 years ago, the origins of Western culture are in ancient Greece. We have the cult of Dionysus. Dionysus was a wonderfully fine god who was him to invoke him was in fact to do a festival. You could not do it separately. So he was, of course, the god of forest, of dance, of ritual, even of drama and theater, which was a very uh, tangible um, creative output of festivals. But let's go back even further. Um, 11,000 years ago, Anatolia, in Turkey, there's a site called Gobekli Tepe. 11,000 years ago is before civilization, right? There is no permanent settlements. What you have is hunter-gatherers. 11,000 years ago, these guys, a hunter-gatherers, were congregating in this site, were making beer and wine from wild crops. They were drinking beer and wine, they were sharing food with their tribe, with other tribes that came from far. They were making art, they were covering pillars, and they were dancing. To me, this sounds like a festival, this sounds like a collective celebration. We know that in doing so, they were able to enlarge their social networks. They were able to make friends with tribes that otherwise they couldn't be do, because they were just so far. You cannot do festivals every week, right? Uh, it's a fact of life. You do have to go and find food, after all. Um, but in this kind of infrequent but high-intensity festivals, these guys were able to create larger networks that allow them to trade, to survive in terms of um, climatic instability, and eventually to forge permanent settlements. What am I saying? First comes the shared ritual, then the city. First comes the festival, and then civilization. Not the other way around. Um, so, this is perhaps um, a big claim, but we can go and find the reasons for it even, even further. 11,000 years ago is still very, 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 um, very little time, if we think in evolutionary terms. So why were humans doing festivals, even then, with such conviction? There must be something very essential. 
Um, and in fact, it's so deeply rooted in ourselves that we can see it in our cousins, in our evolutionary relatives. These are bonobos, or your living closest relative, together with chimpanzees. So let's see, can we have the first two people, please? We're going to have some images. Hold on. Okay, if you can uh, stand there. We will. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. So, these are your living closest relatives. These are bonobos. Um, and I studied them in the wild. I, uh, like Claudia was saying, I spent uh, 3,000 kilometers following a group of wild bonobos, knowing the in and outs of their lives, and looking not only how they fend off the trials of life, but also how they socialize. So what are these guys doing? They're socializing, right? What else? Come on. What are they doing? They're grooming. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and what is grooming? It's touch. Why do you touch somebody next to you? Come on. Okay. That's all right. Now touch them with intention. <laughs> Grooming. Okay, that's beginning to be better. Touch them with intention. Think about it. Come on, do it, do it. Touch with intention. See whether you can find something in their hair. Can you find some lice? <laughs> it's, oh dear, I think he did. Right, good. So you are grooming, but also you're laughing. Ha ha. So this is the key. Primates to bond, our emotional communication is founded on things like grooming, i.e. touch with intention and laughter. When we want to bond with others, we don't go to really convoluted, sophisticated, symbolic language. We revert back to these very ancient mechanisms, i.e. touch with intention and laughter. Right? And laughter, laughter is of course play. This is play. If what you're seeing here is an adult female, and she's She's holding by the wrist this juvenile. And if you can see well, she literally is holding him by the wrist. I, he has no hold on her. She has complete control on him. And these guys, by the way, are about 30 meters above ground. So if she lets loose, that of course she can because she has control, he would probably die. So, huh? And actually, he was laughing here. So it doesn't seem a very good idea. Uh, he's somehow enjoying the risk-taking. Why would he? Because he's risk-taking in a safe space. He's risk-taking in a space of trust. And play does many things. One of the things it does is create, engender trust. You see, this is literally a photograph of the moment of trust. And we know very well what happens when in relationship trust is broken down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't none, honey. So we yeah. So the festivals, through this shared joy, play, they do trust. And play does a lot more than just, uh, than just trust. Let's see what else it does. Of creativity. 
And when you explore, by definition, if you're entering a new space, you find surprise, right? Look at the face of this little guy. It's like his first day in Burning Man. <laughs> and you have to look like this if you are entering a space of surprise. Otherwise, it means that you haven't really challenged any boundary. And ultimately, one of the most amazing things that, to me, play does, and it's, we see it so well in festivals, is that play is, with, is where existential freedom lives. First of all, you need to challenge your fear, the fear that is the status quo, of course, in order to literally throw yourself into uncertainty, to throw yourself um, into, new, um, into new worlds. And as well, freedom plays where you liberate from your inner and outer constraints. So, for example, the German poet Schiller um, thought that after all is gone, really play is the ultimate freedom of human beings. Because that's the only space where we can ultimately be um, relieved of our constraints. Um, but apart from all that, play is, of course, it's just short, it's just joy. It's the incredible emotional height of experiencing joy. And when joy is shared, that's why I use the term shared joy, this is where groups are, bond, are bonded in this way that it doesn't otherwise happen. Um, so this is all very well. And if it, what play is doing is about creativity and shared joy, uh, if, if what play is doing is about creativity and, uh, and bonding in groups, then why don't we have it more? Well, it so happens that it's quite, it's quite fragile. Play cannot happen anywhere. It requires a space. So what's the space where play can happen? It's a very particular one. We have to worry about life is threatened as if he's going to face ostracism because he said something ridiculous. Play requires a, play, a space which is permissive, where individuals can take creative risks. And bonobos have managed to create this amazing, playful society by creating a safe space. In their case, they do it through bonding, through female coalitions. The females bond very strongly with each other and form this lifelong friendships, lifelong bonds, which is the reason why they don't have fatal aggression. Bonobos have, are the only ape to have solved this amazing problem that neither we or chimps have done, i.e. to live with fatal aggression. So literally a safe space where not only you don't have the fear of being ostracized because you said something ridiculous, but also your life is not under threat. Um, so it's in this kind of space that play thrives. And this, this is the kind of space that festivals create. This is why we are, uh, sorry, and this is why festivals can experiment with body ornamentation, body art, with laughter, with humor, with dance, music, and sharing food um, and alcohol, which is at the core of, um, of feasts, of course. Um, so, so we, festivals require safe space. And, but yet I'm reminded, um, I'm reminded that in a time of uncertainty, it's also uh, when we are most prone to trade our safety, um, to give away our freedom in the name of safety. And, and there is, of course, a, a great danger there, especially if we remember that first comes festival and then the city, 
first comes shared joy, then civilization. If we're going to keep civilization at all um, the levels of the meaning, um, I think it's a real time to, to defend joy, to bring joy back to the fore. Um, and in that I was reminded again of, of, of the poet Schiller who in the summer of 1775 wrote The Ode to Joy. It's funny that actually he wrote it in the summer. Um, maybe nature also has its joyful season. And of course Beethoven later took the word to put it in the last movement of his Ninth, ninth Symphony, The Ode to Joy. But it's no, what less people know, actually, that oh, the ode to joy that we all know so well, that we can all you know, remember um, how we felt, how our hairs uh, go up when, when, when we listen to it, is that the ode to joy was first called the ode to freedom. Um, and there might be many reasons why he didn't want to call it the ode to freedom. But it just reminds me that joy and freedom uh, are not separate. And in these times of uncertainty, we really face the risk of giving away our joy and giving away our freedom. So that's why I want to finish with something, not with a note to joy, which is lovely, but a little bit bucolic. I want to finish with something stronger. I want to finish with a defense of joy. Um, this is inspired by a Southern American poet. Defend joy is a trench and a principle. Defended from asphalts and bindings, from mooses and whining, from ex-spouses and timings, from flightlessness and from the physics of now. Defend joy as the last wildlife refugia. Defend it from chainsaws and cages, from the cruelty of time, from safety officers, zealots and schools, from minimalism and from postmodernism and from terms and conditions. Defend joy is a flag, a right, and a must. Defend it with swords, passion, and vows. Defend it outlaws, feral, and howling. Rage, rage, against the dying of the light. I told you, do not go gently into that good night. Defend joy until your night. Defend joy, lest we will all die. Thank you.